All right, it is time, and in uh, counter to uh, many countries that I speak at, in uh, Denmark, you're supposed to start on time. So welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Yaron Brook, and I'm the uh, chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, for this uh, discussion today about the relevance of Ayn Rand in, uh, in today's world. I'm excited about the panel. We've got, uh, we've got some, uh, some exciting speakers here, and I think this is a Seems like a hot topic in Denmark right now, so, uh, so I'm looking forward to your participation. Uh, the Ayn Rand Institute, for those of you who don't know, is a nonprofit, a U.S. nonprofit that is dedicated to uh, spreading Ayn Rand's ideas, uh, particularly among young people, really all over the world. We have a, uh, an Ayn Rand Institute Europe, which is focused on European events. I'm on currently on a seven country, 11 talk tour of Europe where I'm speaking to a lot of young people. Uh, and it's, uh, it's quite exciting. Ayn Rand is uh, more relevant than ever in our, uh, for, for young people who are mm -hmm. attending our universities these days, and we'll talk about that. Uh, there is literature outside about the Ayn Rand Institute, but also some uh, essays by Ayn Rand herself. So if you want to get a first-hand view of Ayn Rand's views rather than what we say she said, uh, you can pick up some brochures outside, uh, some pamphlets of her essays. Uh, take as many as you want. Uh, the, the, you know, if they're not taken here, uh, somebody's going to have to ship them somewhere. So uh, give them out to friends. Uh, do something with them. And um, there are seats up here in the front, and there's, uh, if you want, and there's seats on the sides. So uh, again, thank you all for, co for coming tonight, and um, looking forward to uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good uh, exchange of ideas, and with that, I'm going to pass on the uh, officiating to Christoph. Thank you very much. Is it uh, is it on or not? Uh, Otherwise, I'll just yell. Well, we need it for the taping, I okay. think. So, where's your uh, thing? You need to flip the switch. Is it on? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, many Danes by now should know uh, the name Ayn Rand. She's uh, the mastermind behind the uh, great embezzlement <laughs> that uh, took place here in Europe, whereby billions of uh, euro disappeared from the states or rather the taxpayers into uh, a number of uh, crooks' uh, pockets. <laughs> and um, we know this because the national Danish uh, public television has told us so. Ayn Rand was the person, the philosopher, the ideologist, behind the uh, great swindle. Um, of course, it was documented on Danish national television by a little uh, video footage where she said, um, I'm in favor of uh, private roads, private post offices, and private schools. So that's it. <laughs> we now know that she's uh, the mastermind because in Denmark we now only have private post offices we have a lot of private schools, have always had them, and a number of private roads. However, even though she is a crook, everybody knows it, we'll give her uh, at least the possibility of uh, being defended by some uh, brave people. Sure. We'll have three panelists tonight. We'll have Jaron Brook from uh, the Ayn Rand Institute. Ayn. Ayn, Ayn Rand Institute. Ayn Rand. Alicia Rosenbaum Institute. Yes, Alicia Rosenbaum. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we'll have uh, Lars Seyer Christensen, whom many of you know as the former CEO of Saxo Bank. And we'll have Ryan Smith, writer, philosopher, once in charge of the publication program here in uh, Cyprus. And um, I will try and be the benevolent dictator. Each of the speakers will have approximately 12 to 15 minutes. I'll interrupt them by waving gently. And uh, after their little um, uh, briefs on Ayn Rand, where Ryan will probably be the more critical one, uh, we'll have an internal discussion between the panelists, and I'll open for questions afterwards. And of course, questions are questions, just like A is A, etc. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'll be tough on you if uh, you start uh, rambling on your own ideas, please ask questions and come down to us. So with these words, welcome. Thank you. Jan. Thank you. Thank you all for coming again. 
So uh, I thought I'd talk today about why Ayn Rand is still relevant, why Ayn Rand is in the news, why Ayn Rand gets blamed for everything uh, wrong that seems to happen. Uh, after all, it's not just crooks that, uh, that she has inspired, but uh, if you remember after the financial crisis, at least in the U.S., she was to blame for the financial crisis. Uh, it, it was her ideas that were behind everything that happened in 2008. And uh, for, for a long time, the press and American intellectuals have used Ayn Rand as a scapegoat for almost every problem that exists. If you follow the former economist Paul Krugman, then you know that he, he you know, every three months or so, blames Ayn Rand for something going on in the world out there. So uh, she is a regular, um, uh, you know, I, I person that he attacks and, and that he uses to frame, uh, to frame the world in which we live. So why is she so, so relevant? And why is she attacked uh, to the extent that she is? I think she'll always be relevant. She'll always be relevant because she has presented the world with an interesting, provocative, radical, different, and I believe true philosophy. With a set of ideas that challenge almost everything we have been taught for the last 2,000 years. She upends much of the belief system that we have grown up with, all of us as individuals have grown up with. She tells us that what our mothers taught us, what our preachers preached us, what our philosophers have taught us is wrong. Is wrong. And that's challenging. And it's provocative. And at the very least, it causes people to think and reevaluate, challenges their beliefs. And not only did she do all this, but she did it in the form of novels. Right? You're all familiar probably with Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead. And as a consequence of that, many, many, many more people are exposed to her ideas, are exposed to her philosophy, than would be if they were studying philosophy at a university, or would be if they were just reading nonfiction philosophical books from the bookstore. Millions and millions and millions of people have read Ayn Rand in almost every language on the planet. Her books are now translated into almost every language, certainly every major language, it was a milestone where we pro finally, a few years ago, got Atlas Shrugged in French. And if you know that if you can get a book in French, that's it. You've conquered the world, basically. Chinese was before French. Vietnamese was before French. When you got French, we knew we had every language. Ayn Rand also is the first thinker, really the only thinker, who has defended business who has defended the profit motive, has defended the individual's right to keep what he earns, what he produces, what he makes. And therefore, she is an easy foil, right? A few businessmen do something bad, do something criminal, something that I think everybody recognizes criminal, but Ayn Rand defends businessmen. So it's easy to blame her for what they do. But think about it. I mean, think about whether it's in fiction, in movies, certainly in philosophy. Who is there who defends business, who defends the creator, who defends production, who defends, morally defends the profit motive, and who views businessmen as heroic, heroic. And I think that's one of her appeals, particularly in the business community, is if you read Atlas Shrugged and you're, you're in business, suddenly there's an image there of an ideal business person, a successful one, somebody who has no, no guilt associated with making money and being successful and, and, uh, and challenging the world. And she presents us with a moral code that is consistent with the defense of business and profit a moral code focused, again, maybe not for the first time in history, but uniquely on your own value as an individual. 
Amal code that says, again, counter to our mothers, our preachers, our philosophy teachers, that the purpose of your life is not to sacrifice and suffer. The purpose of your life is not to live for other people. The purpose of your life is not to be a slave to other people's happiness. The purpose of your life, the moral purpose of your life, the ethical purpose of your life is your own happiness. Your own happiness. And she provides principles by which, if one lives by these principles, that happiness is attained, that success at living, that success at being a human being is attained. And that, again, is rare. It's almost non-existent. Nobody provides those kind of ideas. Ryan will talk about, I think, later about the connection of that to Aristotle. But really, there are few, with the exception of Aristotle and Rand, that are focused on what does it take for you as an individual human being. What are the moral principles, the values, and the virtues as you, as an individual human being, to be successful? We hold this dichotomy in our minds. We are taught that to be virtuous, to be good, to be just, means to sacrifice and, and, and to suffer and to think about other people constantly. I, I, I always ask people, you know, you got museums here in Copenhagen. You've probably been to museums, right? You've seen paintings of saints, saints, moral heroes. That's what saints are, right? Moral heroes. Ever seen one of smiling? No, saints don't smile because that defeats the purpose. The whole point of being a saint is the suffering you endured in attaining your moral goal, supposedly. Right? It's about sacrifice, real sacrifice, painful sacrifice. Rand rejects all that. Why? <laughs> Why is the purpose of life to live for other people? Why is the purpose of life to sacrifice? Why is the purpose of life to suffer? Why is the purpose of life to place the well-being of other people ahead of your own? I care more by myself than I do about you guys. doesn't mean I don't care about you, but it just means I care about myself more than I care about you. And I think all of you should care about you more than you care about me. It's you. You only have one life. Live it. So Rand is about the individual living his life, living his life to the fullest as a human being, which means as a conceptual being, which means as a rational being, using your reason to live life fully and make the most of your life. Produce, create, think, innovate. And therefore, when you see when we s when uh, uh, Rand's heroes are architects who create in the realm of art or construction and create beautiful things, functional things, and are successful. Her heroes are business leaders who change the world, make the world a better place for everybody by following their vision, by making their own life better, by making a profit, profit for Rand is a sign of virtue. It's a sign of creating. It's a sign that you reshaped the world in some way, created a value that other people think is good. Otherwise, they wouldn't buy it. They wouldn't buy it. So for her, businessmen, the value-creating businessmen are the heroes. Now, again, the association with crooks, you know, for Rand, the number one virtue, the number one value, and the number of virtue, the value is reason, the virtue is rationality. And we can get into this, and you can ask me questions about this, but it defeats the purpose of rationality. It defeats the purpose of reason to lie, steal, and cheat. Lie, stealing, and cheating are not in your self-interest. They undercut your ability to live fully as a human being. They undercut your ability to really make it in life. When you steal money, you're undercutting your ability to attain self-esteem. You, you are rejecting the idea in your own mind that you are capable of producing for yourself and making your life meaningful. 
you're now depending on other people to produce. And then you are using muscle, which is all stealing is. It's muscle rather than reason to take from them. And most crooks, most crooks are pretty pathetic people. I know Europeans are kind of cynical, but so you think crooks have a good time? I hate movies, you know, like movies with good guys and bad guys, and the bad guys always have fun, right? And the good guys always, good guys always divorced and miserable and sad because they have to fight for the good, right? And that's, that's horrible. It's the bad guys who are having fun constantly. Well, that's not true. If you know laws, he's a good guy and he has fun. So uh, it drives me nuts when I see that in the movies because it's exactly the other way around. But again, it comes from that idea in morality that virtue is suffering, that virtue is sacrifice, that good guys don't have fun, that good guys don't get the girl. But that whole morality is built around uh, a false premise, a false idea, and results in a very, very bad approach that our culture and we all have towards the most successful individuals in our culture. Uh, so why is Rand relevant? Because, because her ideas are interesting, because her ideas are true, because ideas challenge us to rethink our most fundamental premises. And they challenge the people who disagree with her. And uh, because they challenge the people who disagree with her, they have to be knocked down. And she has to be knocked down. And that's what they do time and time and time again. So we're here to try to set the record straight in terms of who Ayn Rand is and what her ideas really represent. So thank you. Thank you, Yaron. Lunk, the floor is yours. There's a little uh, brief on the value of Ayn Rand in uh, business as well as in life. Good to be here. want to question some underlying uh, rationale and the philosophy speak to those guys but I would like to speak a little bit about it from a practical perspective because that's how I have I have predominantly uh, uh, found found Ayn Rand's uh, philosophy very useful because uh, what is interesting about Ayn Rand is that you can actually use her thinking for very practical purposes in in this world and uh, and I have seen with my own eyes uh, both how, how her ideas can improve organizations and uh, how they can give, you know, more uh, more clarity also in, in, in uh, individuals' lives about how the world really how the world really works and, and, and what things are worth pursuing and what things are less worth pursuing. Of course, you got to do your own uh, you you, you got to do your own mistakes and you got to find your own solutions uh, in, in in this world. And I had a, a, a quite a clear idea uh, about uh, what what was what I thought was right and what I thought was wrong, or even before uh, getting acquainted with with Ayn Rand's works. But but having read an awful lot of philosophical and political and business books uh, uh, prior to that, I must say that that Atlas Shrugged is the single most uh, valuable book I have I have ever uh, read in terms of understanding why the world is 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 the way it is and how it's put together. So if anybody in here 
hasn't read Atlas Shrugged, do yourself the favor to do that, and, and maybe that can lead you to also read some of her other excellent books. Uh, but, uh, but it's really a quite specific ideas that Ayn Rand come up with, and, and we have deployed them quite extensively in, uh, in Saxo Bank over the years, and I've seen them, seen them work. Uh, our joint, very good friend, John Allison, who, uh, who ran uh, one of the U.S. largest banks, BB&T Bank, for, for three decades, mm -hmm. I think, something like that, and brought it up from a small local bank to being probably in the top 12 or 10 mm -hmm. even yeah. in, in, in the U.S., uh, I was uh, actually quite delighted to find out years later that he had done pretty much the same thing and deployed the ideas of Ayn Rand into, into BB&T uh, Bank also and had the same experience as I had that uh, it actually was very useful for the organization and for the employees to, to have a clear set of values to, um, to relate to. When you do a business, and, and uh, I often speak to you know, wannabe entrepreneurs or startups or, or, or even accomplished business people. And I would say, for me, one of the most important things in a business is really the value set and the principles that you drive that business with. Of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of technical detail, there's a lot of s competences you need to have, there's lots of, of, of various people you need to build a successful business. You gotta get some good ideas along the way and build some great products. But at the end of the day, uh, those come and go, the people come and go, the products come and go, the services improve over time. But what should, should hopefully be consistent in a business is a, is a value set that, uh, that drives the understanding and, 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 and uh, the direction of the business. And, and I work with my partner, Kim Fournay, uh, also prior to, to, to having, having uh, discovered Ayn Rand on various ways to define the, the values in, in, in Saxo Bank. And I do believe that, that most successful businesses ha have a pretty decent set of values because I don't think really they could be successful if they didn't. But I also found that uh, if you, as the leader of an organization, as the CEO or the owner or, or whatever, puts you in a position of leadership, if you're not very specific about how you want that business to function, if you're not very specific about the value set that you want to, to, uh, to kind of uh, go through this organization at all levels. If you don't give that guidance, you can be sure that some values will build by themselves. You know, people will grab a little here, they'll grab a little there. Some of it might be good, some of it not so good. Not a very coordinated approach, not a very integrated approach. So I would uh, certainly uh, recommend very much if you're in a position of leadership to think very closely about the values you that you set as a guideline for, for, your, uh, for your colleagues and employees not to always knock them on the head with a set of values, but to give them some guidance as to how do we want to interact uh, between ourselves, how do we want to build this business, how do we want to treat our clients, how do we, how do we wanna, how do we wanna drive our innovation process, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if you're not very explicit about that, then, then you will get a set of values that, that may not be explicit, but they'll be there, and they may not be the values that you want. So uh, I think that's very important. You can probably choose other similar values and still still get a good result, but but both for Kim and me it was quite an eye opener when when we actually sat down and thought closely about the the seven virtues that that Ayn Rand uh, uh, reached as a conclusion after many years of thinking were the key driver for a good human life, and we actually said th these values also work for organizations and and in a way uh, organizations are just groups of people that have chosen hopefully freely to cooperate and freely to build something together. Uh, and hence, it's quite logical that what works for those individuals will also work for the organization. So those uh, seven virtues that we also implemented quite specifically and, and explained to people in Saxo Bank over many years, and Yaron has been there also uh, on frequent occasions speaking to our management groups and, and, and to, to our, our, our colleagues in, in general, those are are very specific, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can't run a very successful business if you're consistently uh, negating one or more of these virtues. So what are they? As, as, as Yaron said, the, the primary one is rationality, which, is, which really in business terms means you have to look at the world the way it is. You, you, you have to, if your competitor comes out with a better product, the way to address that is not by trying to avoid it or lie to your clients and tell them that's not really a great product, ours is far better, because ultimately, ultimately the client will work it out and, 
and you will lose to the better competitor. So the rational approach to that is sit down, analyze it. What is it that, that those guys have, have, have built now that is actually better than ours? How do we address that? How do we improve our own offer so, so we are back in the driving seat? Always rationally assess what's going on in the world around you uh, and, and react to it by an organized, rational approach to, to simply meet those challenges. Instead of the alternative, which you see far often than you think, where you just say, well, let's try to avoid it as long as possible. Let's try not to address it. Let's try to, to tell our clients that we are actually the best, even though we know full well that there's somebody out there with a better product. This will eventually kill you if you don't address, uh, if you don't address somebody that's actually better than yourself. And then uh, from that derives a, a series of, of virtues that, that I think are, are very uh, useful in business and very specific. You know, there's uh, the virtue of uh, integrity, meaning if you promise something, you deliver it. If you manage, uh, you have an expectation with your clients, you make sure that you meet that expectation, that you manage it correctly vis-a-vis -vis what you're going to be delivering later on in, in, in life. So, you know, the connection between what you say and what you do, uh, integrity. Uh, independence, uh, y y you should think individually, you should, you should spend the time to sit and analyze, could I improve this process, could I, do I just have to do it like somebody always did it, uh, or can I actually, can I think of a good way to improve a given thing in, in, in my business or in my workflow or whatever, think about the stuff that you're doing, far too many people actually go in, do something that they know is, is not really a very good way to do it, but they've been told to do it, so why not uh, just do it and, and not think more about that. And, and, and that independent thinking is very important. Another virtue is justice. Uh, and, and to me, that means that you, you recognize people for what they are. If they do well, you reward them. And if they don't do well, you certainly don't reward them. You may give them a few warnings, and you might give them uh, some 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 additional chances, but you have to be sure that you make a difference between the people that do well and the people that don't do so well. Because if you don't have that justice uh, in your organization, everybody will notice very quickly that it doesn't actually make any difference whether I do my job well or not so well. I, I, I'm afraid that that is probably what is one of the reasons that many of our public services are, are not functioning very well because there's very little recognition of actually going the extra mile and and the way you get paid is according to how many years you've been hired, not whether you did a great job or, or not. And even, as you see frequently, if you sort of have a bonus opportunity in the public sector, it seems that you, you get the bonus whether you do well or not, right? I mean, this guy that just uh, lost, I don't know how many billions of our tax money, actually got a bonus the other week. Did you see that? So, uh, so justice is very important. And that's also about, uh, about telling people that you think they do well and recognizing them in front of their peers. Uh, another value is, 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 is honesty, uh, and, and that is obviously in the traditional sense, but particularly in the sense of intellectual honesty. You know, if you're, if you're sitting and developing ideas with a group of your colleagues and, and you have a really great idea, you think, and then you realize, shit, she's got a better idea than me over there, you know, but then she's going to get the promotion. Let me, let me just blindly push my own idea, although I know, uh, honestly, I do know, that, that the other person's idea is better. Uh, and, and that intellectual honesty that you pursue what is, uh, what is uh, the, the, the best thing to do, what is the most rational thing to do, that degree of honesty is, is very important in an organization. Productiveness is a virtue. At the end of the day, it's very much fun to sit and discuss uh, projects and make PowerPoints and have meetings and, and, and analyze the situation. But at the end of the day, there has to be a productive outcome. There has to be a dollar somewhere at the end of the process because otherwise we can't pay people's salaries. We can't pay our rents. We, we, cannot, uh, we cannot progress our organization. Again, certainly in a, in a privately owned business, that's a fact of life. If you don't, at the end of the day, deliver a dollar somewhere, everybody's going to be in a not so great place. Uh, and finally, w if you do all of that most of the time, uh, uh, then you can deserve to, to be proud of that. That's kind of more a result of that. But, but I think it's very important that you celebrate your successes in business. So we, in, in Saxo Bank, uh, if there's one thing we're pretty good at is, is partying if we feel that we have a reason to party. Uh, and, and I've always said to people, if your team has done a great delivery, for God's sake, take them out Friday night and, and, and have fun and have a good dinner and get drunk and celebrate as long as you're back Monday morning looking forward and, uh, and, uh, and creating the next big project, right? 
uh, and you must never do it if you actually have been miserable or you actually have failed at what you did and just have a party because it's Friday because that is a terrible signal again if you are celebrating non-performance because then you, you have to distinguish between these things. So that's kind of a very practical way that I saw this working. I saw that people actually like that in general. People, people, people like that their company has values. Uh, they talk about it still, even people that have left us and gone elsewhere because it's a big world out there. Many people, I'm, I'm happy to say, has come back and say, whoa, I really enjoyed that we had all that, all those values and all those, uh, those sort of more philosophical points to work by in Saxo Bank. Uh, and I think that, that I've seen that actually many people take it to heart and, and trying to deploy that also in their, in their own private life and, and, and having improved on that. I've even had people that quit uh, Saxo Bank because of that because they said, now I want to be the big entrepreneur, the big leader, and that's fine. Because if that inspires people to go out and, and build a great business, you know, I'm very happy to have just played some kind of role in, in, in leading to that, uh, to that ambition and to that, that decision. So, so for me, apart from being very interested in the philosophy, of course, for me the, the, the really interesting thing is how can you deploy this practically? How can you improve your own life? How can you improve your business life? How can we, how can we teach people to run better businesses by deploying some of, some of, 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 uh, of Ayn Rand's thinking? So uh, with that, I'll hand it back to the philosophers. Thank you. Ready? Thank you, Lars. Um, I think Ryan is, uh, is um, going to speak without a headset. He wants to be free. Oh, it, it works. It works. <coughs> All right. You want to speak now? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll move. <coughs> Only non Randian in the panel. I am a classical liberal, though. So maybe I guess I hope a friendly discussion, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> Maybe I will be blamed, just like Anne Rand is blamed um, for the taxation scandal, the recent taxation scandal. So, if any of you ever looked into the philosophy of uh, Anne Rand, I'm sure you also encountered one of the uh, criticisms of her philosophy, which are voiced from the standpoint of modern, modern philosophy, um, which uh, will typically say something like, uh, it is not possible to derive objective values. Um, there's something such as the is or divide. And of course, Rand believed that she was able to derive objective values. So why do I click this? Where is the technician? Well, I, sh I assume it's the computer. Yeah. I used to have this job, and I also used to be very angry with the technician. Um, so, um, for example, uh, on, one, at on one hand, you could say something like, human beings evolve as meat-eating animals. That is a fact. Can you infer from that fact that it is a value that we should be eating animals? Most modern philosophers would say, no, there's a divide between those two things. That's a logical error. But on the other hand, nor can you derive from the fact that animals have capacity for pain, emotion, and so on, that it is not right to eat animals. Again, they would say there is a divide, and you cannot bridge this divide. You can't get a value from a fact. And as I just said, of course, Rain believed that she could get a value from a fact. She believed that she had derived an ethical value that was objective. Um, so, in this way, modern philosophy is kind of in a quagmire. <laughs> it is. Uh, unable to prove the fundamental values uh, that are operative in ethical analyses. So this is actual modern uh, philosophy, and you get more and more painstaking and exacting uh, definitions and arguments, teasing out of implications, but you can't actually prove the foundations. It's like if you've read uh, The Fountainhead by, by Ayn Rand, so you could say modern philosophy is kind of like one of, one of these magnificent skyscrapers, but with the exception that no one has figured out how to actually lay a foundation for these skyscrapers. So you actually won't be able to see my slides over here, but uh, we'll find out. 
And for this reason, it has also been said that modern philosophy is in many ways uh, the most intelligent way to be unintelligent, which is something that Rand would no doubt have agreed with, don't you think, Rand? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, as Rand herself once said, these, uh, this, this thing that set us on the path to modern philosophy in, in during the Enlightenment, uh, it is actually treason. Uh, she, she was, uh, if, you, if you look at her, her notes, the reasons are things like Kant and Hume, she was, uh, it's, it's obvious that she was enraged by, by their, their striving to separate these uh, facts and values, to, to limit this view of reason. It was uh, fundamentally opposed to what she thought was should be the purpose of philosophy and by extension should be the purpose of, of man. Um, so, of course, you could say uh, what her actual words were that they're striving to prove that man's mind and reason is impotent. And, uh, of course, they wouldn't say that. They would say that they're trying to take the, the consequence of the is all divide. They're trying to take the, the, the logical consequence of a problem that, that they cannot solve. And so they don't agree with Rand that she solved it, but then they don't claim to be able to solve it themselves either. So these are the guys that she didn't like and thought they were treasonous. And this is the problem we have. They say it's insurmountable getting from a fact to a value. <laughs> and of course, I mean, thought she fixed that. So um, as I said, I'm not going to be focusing on these modern criticisms that we see because they've been voiced a million times before. and. Uh, in my opinion, a lot of them have barely read Ayn Rand. They're like rehashing the same things that other people have said. So what I'd like to do instead is uh, to explore um, the reason why Ayn Rand thought she could bridge this gap between facts and values. And uh, in my experience, at least, that is uh, something that is seldomly explored in, uh, with regards to Ayn Rand. Uh, and the reason or uh, the philosophical method by which she thought she had bridged this gap was through Aristotle. Um, and while Rain didn't have many positive things to say about other philosophers, uh, she always was very public about the fact that she had a debt to Aristotle. For example, at one point she said, if there is a philosophical atlas who carries the whole of Western civilization on his shoulders, it is Aristotle. Whatever intellectual progress men have achieved rests on his achievements. He may be regarded as the cultural barometer of Western history. Wherever, wherever his influence dominated the scene, it paved the way for one of history's brilliant eras. Whenever it fell, so did mankind. And in a very famous interview that I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, Mike Wallace uh, asks her, uh, where, where what does your philosophy come from? And she answers, out of my own mind, with the sole acknowledgement of a debt to Aristotle, the only philosopher who ever influenced me, I devised the rest of my philosophy myself. Now, on the proper face of it, we could presume that Rand was therefore inspired by Aristotle's <coughs> ethics, but that is not the case. She actually doesn't like his ethics. Um, what she likes instead is Aristotle has a lot of uh, scientific observations, primarily about biology, where he uh, looks at diverse biological phenomena uh, and says that we should explain biological phenomena on with basis and reference to reality and we should explain biological phenomena with regards to the aim, purpose or function that these phenomena have. He calls this the telos or um, we could also call it a goal. So but on the other hand, Aristotle didn't think that it was possible to use this kind of method to derive ethical values. But that is uh, what Rand actually thought you could do. So Aristotle would call the telos uh, a purpose set in advance in nature, <coughs> which determines physical phenomena. And I'll come to get to an example now. So that would be something like you look at a duck and you say, okay, this duck has webbed feet. Why does it have webbed feet? Why, what is the telos of these webbed feet? It allows it to swim faster. It allows it to traverse water, to escape maritime predators, and so on. So you could say the aim and purpose of these web feed. This is probably conducive to the duck's existence to have this web feed. That's how we explain it. That's why we see it's 
it's good for a duck to have web feed. It's better to have web feed than it if it had no web feed. So it's a better duck anyway. And this method is especially evident in this quote from Ayn Rand, where she says, man's essential characteristic is his rational faculty. Man's mind is his basic means of survival, his only means of gaining knowledge. So she would say something <coughs> like, just like a duck has web feed or an owl needs night vision if it is to catch rodents as a nocturnal hunter, then man has uh, reason as his primary faculty, and uh, this is what defines his telos. Uh, and if we can accept that, then we can actually derive some objective ethical values about man. So Ayn Rand would hold that it is uh, rationality that has allowed us to go from cavemen, quasi-animals, and to civilization. Um, she would say something like, um, Human flourishing is connected to what goes on in modern civilization. If we are removed more and more from the status of mere brutes, we admit art, we, uh, we, are, we, we, we create affluence, we invent technologies that allow us to live longer, live better lives, and so on. Uh, she would appeal to the self-evident fact that life is better today than it was in the Stone Age, and it's hard to disagree with that. But then she would also say, that reason is, of course, the main wellspring of ethical values, but it's also sort of a tool or a precondition that in order to realize reason, you must apply it, as Lars mentioned, so you get to a productive enterprise, productive purpose, which is what allows us to create civilization and technology. So you could say productive enterprise is a subsidiary e ethical value if a reason or rationality would be the wellspring. So, as Rain herself would say, uh, the defining characteristic is reason, and the telos is the productive enterprise allowing man to invent civilization and technology, which brings him closer to peace. That's not a direct quote, but, but the, the previous quote uh, says so. You could, here's another one. In order to sustain its life, every living species has to follow a certain course of action required by its nature. The action required to sustain human life is primarily intellectual. Everything man needs has to be discovered by his mind and produced by his effort. Production is the application of reason to the problem of survival. So you can see the depth to the naturally scientific and biological method of Aristotle is especially evident in her method as well. You must ground everything in reality. You must try to figure out the rational reason why things work as they do, and then try to optimize your own lot uh, ac according to what you've found out. So through this, some would say peculiar method, Ayn Rand uh, declares that she has, in fact, discovered objective ethical values, something which the majority of modern philosophers would deny. Uh, we'll skip a bit. So I would like to use uh, the remainder of this presentation to explore whether this uh, method is, in fact, valid. And I would do that uh, by contrasting Ayn Rand to another philosopher who works in this Aristotelian tradition. Uh, and so this is Alistair McIntyre, you might know him, and, and, and what he says is, um, no, what I would say is that he is not part of the philosophical mainstream either. He does not represent uh, the, the common four among modern philosophers because he, like Rain, also believes that you can, if not bridge, then at least narrow the divide between facts and values by using this Aristotelian method. So if we compare the two, we might be able to find out a thing or two. So, uh, his argument is basically that, somewhat different from Rand's though, because Rand goes purely through what she believes to be rationality and logic, but McIntyre says, no, another way we could do this is we could nest the moral weight of ethical values within traditions. So, for example, um, prior to the scientific revolutions, a lot of ethical values and propositions, they were carrying the weight of untold previous generations, cultural stigma and taboo, and that would in itself have uh, an effect of making ethical values seem objective to people. But then what happened is that we have the scientific revolutions of the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment, and then uh, we have philosophers coming out of those who are so inspired by the breakthroughs in natural <laughs> science that they say, 
Okay, we're going to do ethics uh, just like natural science, but in McIntyre's um, opinion, that is not possible because then you make the ethical questions wholly logical, wholly individualized, and then all sorts of problems start to arise. Uh, arise, and that is, for example, the problem here, which we've seen is of central importance to to gap for anyone who wants to to postulate an uh, objective ethics. So. Um, if we take a question like why shouldn't they steal, McIntyre's point would be like in uh, formally before the scientific revolutions, before e ethics were individualized, you would get a collectivist answer. You would say uh, no one here would want you to steal. None of your forebears would like you to steal. We're part of a culture where we have certain taboos about stealing. Uh, so don't do it and it would carry a certain weight. And then after the revolution, it's more or less up to the individual to say, okay, we found out there's no actually, no uh, objective ethical values. And you as the individual, you are the arbiter of what is uh, moral or sinful to you. You might steal, but then you might say, oh, that's what I want to do with my life, who cares? So his point is that individualizing ethics like this uh, paved the way for the failure of modern philosophy to actually solve any ethical problems. Uh, and of course, Rand would agree with McIntyre that modern philosophy could, can't solve any problems or hardly any problems, but she would probably have despised the collectivist elements and, and the historical and traditional elements of, of his thinking. However, they would both agree that it's uh, very important to have telos, to use this Aristotelian method if we are to develop objective ethical values. However, um, and this is where things get interesting because um, Rand looks at man's telos and she arrives at these values that we've basically seen. So we have reason, but it, we must apply reason to productive enterprise. And this creates civilizations and technology, which in turn creates human flourishing, which allows man to be more of, more of what he ideally could be instead of just a, a caveman. Uh, Ayn Rand never like the cavemen, she li didn't like uh, people who just looted and plundered, such as Attila. Uh, and so we get the proposition that, all right, civilizations and technology are what pro uh, promote human flourishing, and they're, br they're typically brought about by capitalism and liberalism. Therefore, capitalism and liberalism are the most ethical policies by rational extension of what we have at the root of our ethics. Uh, and I said, as I said, uh, McIntyre uses the same method, but he uh, arrives at some uh, very different conclusions. So, for example, he says liberalism and capitalism, they are these impersonal law-like structures that we just <laughs> smear onto the whole of society. We'll say, you have your rights and I have my rights, and I, I shouldn't interfere with what you should actually do. I just shouldn't uh, violate your rights. And you can earn money, but that's not my, none of my business, really. I could go in my own money and so on. So we become individualized and, and atomized through this uh, uh, kind of uh, liberalism and capitalism. And uh, therefore, uh, he would say that this is not the most ethical of policies because in his opinion, we should go back, we should ground ethics in a tradition, as we mentioned before, in the culture, in the community, and so on. So actually, liberalism and capitalism are part of, part of the problem, not part of the solution. And... Uh, they actually prevent man from realizing his telos, I I exactly the opposite of what Ayn Rand said. Um, yes, so as we've seen, they use a similar method. None of them are in the philosophical mainstream as such, but they arrive at very different conclusions. So we've had Rand, now we have McIntyre, says, okay, we deliberate with our fellow human beings, we develop communal standards, joint values and goals, which cultivates our ethical character, which promotes human flourishing. And I can't even read this slide because we have moved this thing. <laughs> Therefore, the, the, uh, the most ethical politics are not liberalism and capitalism, but, uh, but a participatory government with no limited government, with no individual rights as such. And so we end up in this present solution. We have a situation, we have the mainstream moral philosophers, they can't prove that their values are objectively correct, but they can make very rigorous, almost math-like uh, proofs that their 
arguments would be correct if the values were correct, which they cannot be. And then we have the new Aster Aristotelian tradition, which both Rand and McIntyre could be said to work in. And they claim either to solve the question, as Rand did, <laughs> or to be able to narrow the is or divide considerably, as McIntyre did. But this is why I mentioned how McIntyre, using the same method, arrives at diametrically con uh, opposed conclusion to Rand. Uh, it is that if the weakness of modern philosophy is that it cannot bridge or narrow the divide, the weakness of the Aristotelian method seems to be that um, it is in practice open to having a lot of personal intuitions from the person working in that tradition smuggled into the analysis. So is it really objectively valid? We can discuss that. And so one final point I would like to voice here is that uh, using McIntyre as a comparison as such would allow us to end with uh, an observation, which uh, many of you have probably suspected, but it's hard to corroborate, and that is that if you read the criticisms of Ayn Rand, even from academics, uh, professors, and so on, it's usually the same points that are being rehashed, and uh, they, they, they typically uh, attack her on the basis of being a poor philosopher. But then if you compare with McIntyre, he uses the exactly the same method. Um <laughs> he just <laughs> arrives at different <laughs> conclusions, and he is an academic insider himself, whereas Rand was an academic outsider. So this comparison might be able to tell us something about the critique. That is it really the arguments that people critique, uh, criticize when when they attack Ayn Rand, or is it uh, perhaps uh, the the relative level of s uh, of erudition relative to someone who was a professor, or um, the, the declaratory or sometimes slightly oracular way in which she voiced her points, or perhaps finally the very radical free market conclusions that she reached. So, thank you everybody. We'll have um, a short discussion within the group. I might interfere at some point as well. But um, who wants to take the floor first? Will it be you, Johan? Or sure. Or <laughs> sure. I mean, I would just say that I think um, that I think Ayn Rand's discussion of the is-ought gap. How do you how do you derive an ought right from reality from from what is um, is is richer than what Ryan presented. Now he's limited in time, so so that's understandable. Um, and and but worth really pondering and worth really thinking about. So I encourage you to read uh, a, a short essay that she wrote, well, it's not so short, but an essay she wrote called The Objectivist Ethics, <coughs> where she explains the, the, the foundation for her bridging this problem. How do we know what's right to do using reason based on the facts of reality? And, uh, you know, I think central to that question, which Ryan did not bring up, but central to that question is the question of, of survival. That is, is the question of uh, how do we survive as human beings? Um, and uh, the fact that the choice we all face, really, to some extent, in every decision we make, but certainly in the important decisions we make, the moral decisions we make, is a choice between life and death. And that, that as living beings, we can die. Wi without death, morality means little. It, it's that possibility of really, really bad outcomes that makes that choice really, really, really important. And it's facing that choice, facing that alternative of life versus death. And then the question becomes, well, how does one achieve life? What is it that leads to death as a human being? What is it that leads to, to life? Is, I think, the crucial, I in the matter of ethics, the, cr the crucial question that Ayn Rand asks. And uh, you know, I think the answer she comes to is, is, is one that's hard to refute, and that is that, uh, you know, assuming we have free will, which I think we all do, um, it, it's the extent to which we think. I mean, uh, uh, Laws talks about the fact that to be successful in business, one has to think, one has to use reason, one has to look at reality and accept the facts of reality and integrate those facts, and, but use the mechanism that we have, our ability to think rationally, to succeed in whatever we do in life, in business, in, in relationships, in, in, in how we conduct ourselves, to be successful, you have to think. And to survive, Ayn Rand argues, I think rightly, that you have to think. And therefore, rationality or reason becomes that primary value because 
of that alternative of life and death, mm. and that only reason can provide life uh, in in um, in history. I just say that the skyscraper <coughs> um, with the foundation. Uh, I don't I don't think of modern philosophy as a Frank Lloyd Wright building. I think of modern philosophy as a Gaudi building. If you've ever seen Gaudi from from Barcelona, ugly, distorted, non-functional. That's modern philosophy, whereas Frank Lloyd Wright is too beautiful to be associated with modern philosophy. But let me ask you a question on that. Um, I believe that people have different preferences in life. And um, that's one of the reasons why I, uh, I uh, find it a bit naive to uh, conclude that a crook can't be happy or a dictator can't be happy. Why wouldn't it be possible for such a person to be happy, given his uh, preferences? We all have different preferences, no question about that. Some, like Gaudi, some, some preferences like, uh, are good for you and some preferences are bad. Some people have a preference for flying, but jumping off of the building and flapping their wings will lead them to crash and die. So the fact that you have a preference does not mean that it's going to lead to success. We have a nature. We are particular biological being, and our minds have a particular nature, our physicality. So you can have a preference for cyanide, it'll still kill you, right? So your preferences do not necessarily automatically guide you towards success and not necessarily guide you towards, towards happiness. I believe, Rand believed, and I think this is true based on empirical evidence, that there are certain actions that humans take, like lying, stealing, cheating, that lead to failure, failure at living, failure at happiness. Uh, uh, you know, the f my favorite example, but you, there are dozens of these, is Bernie Madoff. I, I don't know if you remember Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff stole $60 billion. You'd think he'd be happy. He had $60 billion. But it turns out he's in jail today. You can ask him, and he'll tell you that he's happier in jail than he was when he had, he, he fulfilled his preference. His preference was $60 billion. But that doesn't mean it's good for you. Your preferences don't mean it's good for you. To evaluate whether something's actually good for you requires work, requires thinking, requires evaluating, and it, it requires the guidance, as Laws talked about, of virtues. It requires the guidance of principles because life is complicated. It's hard to figure out every preference, whether it fits or doesn't fit, and I have to do that all day. It would, my mind would blow mm. up, but I know. Honesty leads to success. Dishonesty leads to failure. I just am honest. I don't have to think every time, should I lie? Shouldn't I lie? I just follow the principle. So I think most people's preferences, if I can talk about most people's preferences, are wrong. Most people are not happy. Most people screw up their lives. Most people are not successful at everything that they do because they have bad preferences. They've never challenged them. They've never thought about them. They've never rationally examined them. And uh, and this is some of the difference between kind of Austrian economi economists and 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 uh, objectivism is is we don't just accept people the way they are. The whole point of morality is to tell you how to live. It's not just accept how you live. It's to say no, you're doing this wrong. There's a better way to do it. But then you rule out that uh, crooks can die happy or dictators can die happy. I mean, all you have to do is read about Stalin and Hitler and dictators and so on, and none of them, none of them. None of them experienced happiness, never mind died happy. They might have experienced joy at a, a, you know, at a particular point in time, but they don't experience happy, not in the Aristotelian sense of happiness, of really living life fully. No, I don't think any of them are happy. I don't think, I, I don't think politicians are happy. All you have to do is go to, to the parliament here and meet some of them. They're miserable, pathetic, <laughs> uninteresting, boring people. And I, uh, I don't think they're happy. I don't think uh, they're happy. I, I've met a lot of politicians. Mm. Never met one that I thought was really enjoying life, you know, f living life fully. It, it's just, you know, because they're, 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 they're doing all the wrong things. Well, um, <laughs> look at Bill Clinton or oh, Hillary. He happy? Oh, he's miserable. Is look he at happy? him. All you have to do is look at him and see how miserable he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I know a couple of politicians in Parliament who are very happy. They are elected. They show up from time to time. <laughs> they don't have to work too much. They that don't have to worry about uh, but making. That doesn't a lead to human. That none uh, of that leads to happiness. The the fact that you're 
I- you don't have to do much is the, is the opposite of happiness. Happiness is about having a purpose. It's about being driven by something. It's about being engaged with the world and with reality and with other people and creating win-win relationships with other people and living, living. And, and these people are not living, not in a full sense of what it means to be human and to mm-hmm. live fully. So, so that's on the individual level. But if we look at the collective level then, um, you would think that um, successful countries or relatively successful countries, capitalist-leaning countries, would outcompete the other countries. But you don't really see... Uh, you mean happiness surveys? You no, mean hap- not nec- necessarily mm. happiness surveys. But mm. I think everybody can see that uh, free market capitalism is a better ideal yeah. and better in practice. How come that some countries just stick to the same old rotten policies and, and have Because it's immoral. For, for decades? Because capitalism is immoral. They've been taught it's immoral. People, people, d- people don't follow their monetary preferences. People follow primarily, deep down, their moral preferences. And their moral preferences are guided by what their mother, their preacher, and their philosopher have taught them. And their mother, their preacher, and philosopher have taught them that self-interest is bad, that pursuing your own self-interest is bad, that, that thinking about the collective and thinking about those poor kids in those neighborhoods and doing all and redistributing wealth and sacrificing those are noble and good. And people vote to increase their taxes all the time because they think that they're doing good in the world. Uh, rich people in California constantly vote to raise their own taxes, uh, not because it's actually good for them, but because it reduces the guilt, unearned guilt that's associated with having a rotten philosophy, that having a rotten moral code. So the world, I believe, is shaped by morality. And if you have a rotten moral code at its core, which I think Europe has and the United States has, then you're going to reject capitalism. Capitalism is about self-interest. Capitalism is about pursuing your life. And if that's viewed as immoral, people vote against it all the time. Mm. But do you say that people suffer from, from false consciousness? Yeah. Do you use the same concept that some Marxists would use I mean, I, I give Marxists credit, right? Marxists at least have a vision of the world, right? They have a vision of, of, of what human beings should be like, and they're wrong, and they're counter to, to human nature, but at least they're idealists. My problem is most people, most people, you know, are, yeah, people are just what they are, and let's leave them alone, and let's not provide them with guidance, and let's not give them virtues and values, let's not pretend that there's something that works and something that doesn't uh, in life. And, you know, life is just, I think that's wrong. I, 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 to that extent, yeah, I, I have more in common maybe with them because they have a vision. They have some ideal, I, I, ideal. I have an ideal that I think is consistent with reality. I have a deal that I think is consistent with human nature, with individual human nature. Theirs goes against individual human nature. <coughs> so, so, yes, I think people can be better. I think people are better than they were 200 years ago, and we see that, and how rich we are, and how, ri- how, how did we become rich? It's by individuals. Today, if 250 years ago, I asked any audience, pretty much, except for maybe a few exceptions, who does your life belong to? Anywhere in the world. The answer would have been, well, to the king, or to the state, or to the church, or to God, or to something, right? 250 years ago, almost uniformly, everywhere in the world. Today, one of the great advancements, I think, in, in changing people the way people think is you ask an audience, who does your life belong to? Even in China, and my guess is, I haven't done this, even in Vietnam, certainly in Eastern Europe, and they say it belongs to me. So we have already moved in a Randian direction in a sense that people at least recognize that their life is theirs. Now, we need to give them the tools by which to make that real, the, the values, the virtues, and the confidence in that statement. Because they say, my life belongs to me, and then, then they quickly demure because they've been taught, again, from by ethicists that that's not right. So values change. They change all the time. And I think as we become freer, the reason we become freer is because values change for the better. The Enlightenment helped change values for the better. I think they're not still yet good enough. They can be improved. This is the role of philosophy. Philosophy is not there just to observe and say, this is how people are. Philosophy is there to give us guidance, to, 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 to help us improve as human beings and therefore as, as societies and cultures. And we won't fully embrace capitalism. We won't fully embrace freedom, which is what I think capitalism is, until we embrace 
uh, this idea of self-interest. We embrace the idea that our life is what's important and there are means by which to make our life better. It's not just random. It's not, it's not just whatever. It's not just our preferences where we don't know where they came from. But no, rationally chosen preferences, which are values. In philosophical terms, rationally chosen preferences are values. Lars, what about you? In your life as a businessman, do you observe business people uh, using Ayn Rand in their daily life, or do you uh, experience the opposite, that uh, people might actually, business people might actually be guided by something else and be immensely successful nevertheless? Uh, I observe certainly people uh, both deploying Randian like values and, and other people that don't. That, that, that is quite clear. Um, uh, for me, again, this, this is getting sort of very, very s not theoretical, but very, very deep philosophical mm -hmm. points. But for me, it's more about observing reality, what, what seems to work. And, and I mean, in, in my view, most successful businesses deploy something along the lines of what I described. Maybe not with such a completely explicit understanding of that's what they're doing, but, but that is what they're doing. If they were constantly lying to their clients or cheating their clients or stealing from their clients, you could be short-term successful in that until somebody found out, but I don't think it would. I anybody would really suggest that that would be a very rock-solid basis for building a, a large company over decades, right? So I think, in practical terms, people people actually deploy pretty sensible values in good businesses. That's why they become good businesses. And there are other other companies that don't become good businesses because they 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 don't deploy. Uh, productive values or things that event eventually uh, leads them to, to succeed. Like, for example, when I uh, say to, uh, when I speak to a lot of young entrepreneurs, many of them have this idea, actually, that, 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 that the, the corporate social responsibility, or whatever you want to call it, uh, of the company is a higher value than the company being profitable or the company succeeding in its, in its, in its, uh, in I in its purpose. And I, I would run away screaming from an investment where that was kind of the proposal. That was the key reason why you had the company. I don't mind that you spent some of your profits on, on all sorts of charity or whatever, whatever makes you, uh, you, you, you know, takes your buck. But if you say to me that I only do it for, for this purpose, once I will, I will generally predict that that company is not going to be very successful. And I, I would really like to see a company where they, I know there's a lot of companies that pretend that, <laughs> that they actually do this only for the good of humanity, but in reality, if they're successful, that, that is largely something they pretend, and they're actually underlying that they're running normal, profitable businesses. And there's nothing wrong with having a, a good heart or having a, a good, uh, good intentions, but, but at the end of the day, I do believe that the, the, the real life observance of what works and doesn't work is, is what's uh, relevant for me, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I would say, let, let's just suggest that, that we all had decided we didn't want to be productive. You know, th this is a stupid value and it's not grounded in anything that, that we can prove or, or whatever. But I can tell you, if everybody in, in the world stopped being productive, I would say we have about 96 hours left <laughs> in humanity, right? And they won't be very <laughs> pleasant either, right? So, so this, I think, is just sort of the logical argument that, that if everybody was politicians or everybody was, was thieves, you know, that the, there were no people with any other waking up with any other idea in the morning than going out and stealing things. You know, that again, mm -hmm. we would have very, very short uh, time left in, in, in humanity and, and it would be a very unpleasant time. So look at the reality here. You can, uh, I believe that, 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 you know, for all practical means and purposes, th things that uh, you surround yourself with and things that you have to interact, of interact with is in a given way, right? I mean, I mean, you could speculate that what I'm sitting on here is not a chair, it's something entirely different, but for all practical means and purposes, this is a chair, and I'm sitting on it, and I'm relatively confident that, that I will stay seated on it, right? You can speculate that a subway train is actually a, a butterfly, but go stand in front of it and find out if it's a butterfly or a subway train, right? Uh, so I just think for practical purposes, the world is largely as it is, you have to interact with it rationally. You have to interact with what you observe. Would I rule out completely that the perception we have specifically is probably quite easy to prove that you could look at it differently, right? This is a set of, of small, tiny particles that, that in total sort of adds up to Yaron Brook. But I can't see him as a whole bunch of neutrons and, 
and molecules, etc. because it doesn't make any sense. For all mm -hmm. practical means and purposes, this is Yaron Brook, and I can interact with him, I can work with him, or I can work against him, or I can do whatever. But I have to kind of accept logically that he's Yaron Brook, and I, I take point of departure on that. And for me, that, that goes about all business. And I'm happy for other people to be irrational or dream something else. They can just test it against reality, and at the end of the day, I think they will they will find out that there is some kind of reality out there and, and, and it will not treat them kindly if you don't react rationally to it. So when business people talk about corporate social responsibility um, and are successful, are they then just hypocrites or, or no, are I'm misguided? Not saying you, I'm not saying you can't do that. And I would say, mm. I mean, I supported lots of things uh, in, in my life that I thought was valid causes, including this institute at some point, right? Um, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong whatsoever with that, but if you pretend that that's a single purpose of your business, uh, then, then I get very suspicious because I don't believe it, point one. And secondly, I don't think it's going to succeed. And uh, it's only going to succeed on basis of irrationality, at least. It's possible that you can have a completely rational company, but it's not more irrational than then it knows how to get the straw into the coffers mm -hmm. of the state and suck support and subsidies out. And in a way, <laughs> you know, I don't want to mention we're quite good at that in this country. There's a number of businesses that have no practical purpose except sucking money out of the state's pockets, right? And, and that's also a way to make a living, obviously, when we have mm -hmm. put our world together the way it is. And that might be quite rational under those circumstances if you're a if you're, if you're new wave uh, wave energy company is never ever going to make a profit at least get some mm -hmm. politicians to pay you and that's still a rational way to approach that but mm -hmm. is it good for the country or is it good for the world or is it good for the humanity that if everybody deployed themselves on stuff that is completely uh, completely dependent on irrational allocation of resource uh, no i don't think so and capitalism is really about allocation of resource that's what it's about that we make lots of mistakes in capitalism but those mistakes hurt us, and, and if you make sufficiently many s mistakes, you're out of business, right? The people that, that, that get it right more often than wrong, they keep growing, and they build better and better products, and they build better and better services. And just to round off with this thing you said about countries that are capitalistic, why don't they dramatically outperform uh, countries that are, are not? And I, I think actually they do, but, mm. uh, but I mean, <laughs> I can remember when mm. I, first, uh, I first put out the the Atlas Struct in Denmark, mm -hmm. and I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to print the 5,000 or however many it was the first time, I want to have a foreword in there written by me and yeah. Tim, right? So I wrote this foreword, and I sent it off to Lena Peacock, who, who actually owns the rights of all Ayn Rand's books, because she, she kind of left her legacy to him, uh, and he personally wanted to approve this foreword, and I was like, shit, uh, this, is, this is pretty, pretty scary. And I was quite happy it only come back with one red line, really. You know, I thought it would come back with lots of problems, right? But they had written in there that something to the to the to the line of, of it is thought provoking today that probably the most free economy in the world today is China, which was my view at the time, and it's my view today. And that actually came back with a red liner from Leonard because he said there is not going to be an Atlas Struct out there that says that <laughs> that the Chinese economy <laughs> is more free than <laughs> than the U.S. economy. But I will venture that for all practical purposes, the Chinese economy is far, far freer than most of the economies we have in Western Europe, and that's why they do so damn well. They're coming from a very bad point of departure, mm -hmm. but they have consistently outperformed the West and continue to consistently outperform mm -hmm. the West because they have capitalism. They, they, they actually interact in far more capitalist way with far less restriction than we do in the Western world. That's why they're doing well. You're one of the few business people in Denmark speaking aloud about capitalism quite deliberately. Why do you think so? Is it because most uh, business people in uh, Denmark are afraid, or uh, is it because most are uh, dependent on the state, or what is the reason why they're keeping silence, even though they, as business people, would be uh, some of uh, Ayn Rand's heroes? Why are the heroes keeping silence? I, I think it's, it's probably all of the above. You know, a lot of business people actually don't really care about anything but business, and I think that's fine. It's probably an aberration for me that I spend so much time doing all sorts of other stuff than, than mm. business, right? Maybe I would be uh, more successful at business if I didn't spend so much time uh, arguing with politicians and, and doing all this stuff. So a lot of business people are probably just even more rational than me. They just stick to business and, and they let the rest of us sit and, and fight it out like this. I can remember Jack Wells told me that, that <laughs> you know, I should really focus on the business and not on all these politics, you know, because that was just that was just bad for business, etc. So I would say that's part of it, that simply a lot of them 
have worked very hard all their life. They, they are not interested in philosophy. They're not interested in politics. And they actually think the whole thing is just a, a stupid way to spend their time. And that's totally respectable. Secondly, I would say there's definitely a group that are scared of, of speaking up publicly. I would say after a good bottle of red wine up in North Zealand, you can hear people that are way more capitalist <laughs> than me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but when you tell them, why don't you write a bloody letter for Berlin's Katoon or something, say, oh, I don't like to do that because maybe people wouldn't like it and uh, maybe, I would, maybe people would think I was stupid or I couldn't defend the argument. I mean, I actually, I won't say who, but, uh, but I took somebody really on the word and I said, I'm happy to, I'm happy to actually check your letter. If you promise to send it, I will check that you're not making any mistakes in there because he was really worried about venturing into this space and people would laugh at him because maybe he made a little mistake. So I, I gave him confidence that, that actually this letter was correctly put together and, and he sent it off happy and he was very happy when it appeared in Berlin Institute uh, a couple of days later. So a lot of people are scared of, of, of getting involved. And of course, uh, and that's the real sad part, I also believe that some of them are scared because they are very dependent on, on public money. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, individual people working in the public sector, in fact, I know a lot of people that we have spoken to in, in politics that, you know, come up and say, I totally agree with what you're saying about the public sector, but I cannot say it because I work in the public sector and all my colleagues are going to gang up on me and get me fired if, if, I, if I say this. So there's a lot of people that are scared, and in the economy, we are really... That the, you know, we have a tax pressure of somewhere in the late 40s, high 40s, right? But in rea the reality, the, the size of the public economy is world uh, about 50%, as, as you well know. So there's more public sector economy in Denmark than there's private sector. So even if you want to be independent of it, it's nearly damn near impo uh, impossible not to be dependent on the state in some way, shape, or function. And no matter what you do, you can't, you can't really not be dependent on it. And then some people are brave enough to challenge that. and. Some people think, ah, oh, maybe it's better to just live a quiet life and suffer the pains and, and try to make a good living anyway, right? Right? Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, start giving the floor to uh, the public. I, I would like to ask but one last question. Okay, so yes, sure, uh, sure. No, nope. I... Um, All right, so, uh, Your Honor, just uh, quickly, so you mentioned that... Um, post-enlightenment values, there were an improvement yes. in Iranian terms and so on. But what do you think about, so y yes, we've had individualism in one respect, but we've also had hedonism in another. You know, Ayn Rand, uh, she, she famously railed against the Woodstackers. Wha why do they need to do all these drugs, all this yeah. promiscuous sex and so on? What do you think about both the conservative, but also like the uh, the communitarian argument that, that people need to have their morals and their, their taste and their aesthetics and their lifestyles bettered by their drugs in a way? Because it would seem that, at least on the hedonism point, the Iranians have a beef or a point of Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think there's, a, um, th there's an elitism or, or a, 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 you know, I think coming from Plato, really, we're, we're, we're smart. You know, there, there's all those people out there. They don't know what they're doing. They, 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 they don't know anything. And we need to, through tradition or through religion or through something, we need to provide them with this moral anchoring. I, you know, I think Rand rejects that. I think she believes that every individual has the capacity to think, capacity to reason, and therefore every individual has the capacity to understand rationally why certain things are in their self-interest and why certain things are moral. Uh, and, and that morality is, in that sense, available to everybody, and they don't need that morality to be uh, embedded in traditions and in religions and in authoritarianism. If you think about religion, it's kind of an authoritarian form of morality. Uh, but uh, can be taught it rationally. <coughs> um, she rejected hedonism because she, 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 she thought hedonism was the uh, rejection of morality. It was the rejection of the responsibility to think for yourself, the responsibility to take responsibility over your own life. I, I, it was the rejection of values. It was the rejection of really of pursuing values. Um, so, but she didn't, and she viewed hedonism as a direct consequence of modern philosophy. You know, as 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 you know, when you're taught that, as Law said, the chair might not be there, and the subway might be a butterfly, and whatever, then nothing exists and nothing matters, and might as well have pleasure and forget about it all. Or, in a more modern framework, uh, you get nihilism. So hedonism and nihilism, I think, are, are two related. Uh, you get nihilism. Well, then I'm angry at the world because the chair might not be here, and nothing's absolute, nothing's reality. So I just want to smash stuff. I just want to tear stuff down. I just want to knock things off. 
I just want to yell and scream and, and break stuff. And I think that's what we're seeing more and more with young people, particularly in, at, at, in some American colleges and in and, and some places around Europe. You're seeing this anger in the form of nihilism. But they're all products of modern philosophy. They all, I don't think, are, are in, in you know, just, just things that happen. They're, they're, they're products of the ideas that are being taught at our universities. Okay, let's um, have some questions, real questions, short ones. Yes. After Nietzsche's attempted murder of God, the road, of course, was paved for a philosopher like Ayn Rand. But isn't the elephant in the room really religion? I mean, it wasn't slain, so we, we still have a lot of yeah. baggage all these uh, things like the good guys are boring and stuff like that. Isn't it religious baggage that is still there? Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think it is religious baggage. I think that what we've got is while we killed Christianity metaphysically and maybe epistemologically, that is, we, we all accept that knowledge comes from m those of us who are not professors of philosophy accept that knowledge comes from observation and comes from from we, we, we accept the scientific method, we, we accept that we can discover and know pretty much anything given enough time and given the resources, that knowledge is, uh, that reality is available to us. Epistemologically, a in a sense, and metaphysically, <coughs> we've accepted secularism. But where we've never really challenged the Christi the Christianity, primarily, is in ethics. Right? We've never challenged Christianity in ethics. And the Enlightenment, the th I think the failure ultimately of the Enlightenment is, while they, while the f in the founding document of the American, the Declaration of Independence, it says you have an inalienable right to pursue happiness, your happiness. There's no moral foundation for that because it's still they're still Christian in in a in a moral sense, and it, and it, so I think until um, Christian ethics are slain, we will not we will not be able to uh, to fully realize capitalism, or we will not be able to fully realize. Uh, uh and I think most secularists, I mean, most secular philosophers are, are unfortunately uh, linked to that Christian ethic. I mean, even this idea that morality was embedded in our traditions, in our communities, what is that? What was the tradition? <laughs> the tradition of the community was Christian ethics. That's what it was uh, for 2,000 years. It didn't lead to much. We didn't, get, we didn't get become very successful and very rich as a consequence, but it was there. So uh, that still is what needs to be uh, challenged. And I think... You know, Rand is pretty much the only one who does it com comprehensively. You have even the new atheists still latch on to kind of the altruistic Christian morality in, in spite of the fact that they challenge Christianity in pretty much every other form. Yeah. Hi, uh, Lars. Uh, you, you mentioned that there's like seven tenets which you apply in your, in your life as a businessman. And one of them was individuality, right? If I've been in a, in a working in a company, a big international one, where uh, where I could see in my work in the Excel sheet that there was no order in, in the way they prioritized tasks. And when I mentioned it to my like of course like I, I believe in Ayn Rand, I believe that, that if if I do well I get rewarded, right? But my manager didn't like felt exposed that, that it was her that 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 she fucked up and she did not like that her subordinate came and, and questioned <laughs> her about the task. How how do I tackle that uh, in uh, in my workplace? If I want to live by the tenets, how how do I actually uh, uh, apply well it? Well I think the uh, the seven the seven virtues, one of them is not individuality actually, I think you're thinking yes. about independence, right? Uh, so independence, uh, you know, the freedom of, of thinking and questioning things, uh, uh, I think you're, you're the one that's in the right and, and, and your supervisor is one that's wrong. And, and in the long run, you're probably going to do better than her because she's a very poor supervisor if she does not take into account that somebody comes with a, a, a constructive uh, suggestion for improving services. And if I ever, or whatever it was that you were trying to improve, and if I heard about leaders in an organization where I was the, the CEO, I, I would be pretty upset about that if, if I heard that people were keeping down uh, other people coming up with attempts at improving the, 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 the overall service. So I don't think she's going to go very far because if she does that to everyone, 
per definition, her department is going to stand still, and, and, and it's not going to uh, improve, hence she's not going to get her promotion, which is, which is probably what she's pursuing, and another person that, that leads differently and try to get the best out of their people, it's much more likely that that department will do very well, and ultimately that person will, 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 will get some kind of benefit from that, and the people that work there will, will also have benefit from that. So of course there are lots of people that live uh, irrationally in, in business also. It's not like that it's only in the public sector you have irrationality. You have lots of irrationality in private business as well, trust me. Uh, and, and the worst thing is really, you know, the people hire, the never hire people that are better than themselves or are scared of people that are smarter than themselves, etc. I mean, I, I would love everybody in my business to be smarter than myself. You know, that that that's uh, that would be great, right? And and some of them definitely are. So so if you cannot if you cannot look for the good in people and 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 give them chances to develop that, I would say as a leader, you want to give responsibility to people for more or less defined tasks, so you have the possibility to evaluate the outcome. And obviously, if 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 you're young and and and, and you you are new in, in a job, you give a manageable smaller task that you know wouldn't bring down the business if if it went wrong. But if that got solved well, then you would have a bigger responsibility next time, you have a bigger responsibility next time. And that is the way that you develop your internal leadership uh, over the long term. I mean, it actually, it's a failure for an organization if it has to go outside and collect all its leaders from outside. It should be building all of the leaders from the inside. Occasionally, of course, you may need some skill set that you don't have. But if you don't build your own leadership through exactly letting people have a chance to, to, to come up with improvements and enhancements, you you are probably not gonna gonna do very well in the in the long run, and certainly people that individually uh, uh, try to keep down um, uh, 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 people below them that that have have great ideas, I don't think will be very successful in the long run. I would say one thing though that independence doesn't mean that you shouldn't respect that you are to some extent standing on shoulders of of somebody else. It doesn't mean that everything that your supervisor do is wrong just because you want to think about it independently. So of course it should be constructive. And it shouldn't be so disruptive that if everybody in the business said every time I said let's do this in Saxo Bank, everybody said that's completely stupid, Lars. I got a much better idea. <laughs> At the end of the day, somebody's got to say, well, let's just go with one of these ideas, right? So it's not uh, by independence. I don't mean that you should you should rip everything apart at every single possible option, right? But if you genuinely think you have an improvement to suggest, and you suggest that in a constructive way, I it has to be a very poor leader that doesn't listen to that, right? Now, there is, of course, the possibility that you were wrong and she was right, and, and actually she had the better way, but, uh, but, but that's also a possibility, and over time, I'm sure you, you, you will find out who, who uh, did that, and ultimately, if you try that too many times and you say, well, there's no way forward for me, either you'll ask for a transfer to another department, or you'll leave and go to another company, and, and if you're the good guy, that's a that's a company that's going to suffer. It has a culture that that leads to to those kind of outcomes. Yep. Uh, hello. Um, back to the elephant in the room: religion. Uh, Denmark recently banned the burqa. Um, I guess they're trying to make sure that young Muslim women are free in Danish society as well. Uh, what is your opinion on this? I mean, I'm against banning clothes unless you can uh, unless you can show that force is being used, and then the force being used is individual, and you 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 know you put the guy in jail if he's forcing his 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 wife or he's using violence against his daughter or whatever. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm against banning clothing. I think it's it's a sign of the West's failure to actually challenge Islam and what we should be talking about, which is the fact that they have a set of rotten ideas that Islam is stupid, that Islam is barbaric, that Islam is silly, and uh, we should be challenging them intellectually with, with better ideas and presenting better ideas. W one, of the, one of the real, you know, so, so on the one hand in Denmark, you believe in multiculturalism, right? All cultures are equal, but then you ban clothing, right? I, now, I don't believe in multiculturalism. I believe that a certain set of values, certain sense of behavior, certain sets of cultures, civilizations, call it Western civilization, civilization de developed in Western Europe and the United States uh, since the Enlightenment. That is superior to anything else that exists in the world. There are no other cultures that even come close to the, cu to the culture of Western civilization. What you should expect people who come here is to, <coughs> is to adopt that culture. It's to the melting pot, the American kind of style melting pot. 
But what, what Europeans do is they separate. They say, no, no, go live over there. You don't have to adopt our culture because your culture is as good as ours. Oh, but we don't, you know, but it's offensive that you wear this. So we're going to be. So it's, it's neither here nor there. Instead of a real intellectual challenge to Islam and particularly to the, to the, to the radicals, a real uh, uh, saying that your behavior is barbaric, your behavior is evil. Putting a woman in a burqa is immoral. It is barbaric. It is horrible. But it's still clothing, right? So, so you, you've got to judge it. You've got to declare it. But, but it's not just a, the clothing. It's, it's a lot of the behavior that, that comes with it is barbaric. And you have to call it that. And it's primitive. And you have to say it's primitive. And you have to say, we've got a better model. Adapt to our model. And, you know, I think we did that. A lot of the problems that we see in terms of lack of assimilation, in terms of the radicalization uh, within Islam would go away. I uh, I was against this uh, this prohibition, uh, and, and and I didn't realize that the the political party that most people normally associate me with actually were in the government that put this through. So I was in in clear opposition to to that because first of all, I believe that that the assumption has got to be that 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 woman is in that burg uh, against her own will somehow, which I believe there are already laws covering. You know, there are other laws saying you cannot force people to do stuff like that. So I'm sure. You could have covered that by other laws if that's really the case. Now, let's just assume for a second that the lady actually is there out of her own free volition. What have you just done to her life now? You have, you have, you have now put her into a flat where she can stay the rest of her life because now she's going to get arrested or get fined every time she walks out. So either way, I think it's a bad solution. And what tops that up is, of course, that here in Denmark, we evade from calling things the right name. So we didn't make a prohibition against burkas, right? We made a prohibition because nobody wanted to <laughs> say, let's no make a prohibition against the uh, burqa and be honest about it. We made a prohibition against face covering materials, right? So now <laughs> you cannot dress up as a Father Christmas and you cannot dr dress up for, for <laughs> a, 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 what is it called, a fashion party or, or anything like that uh, without actually running risk of being uh, at least get fined, you know? So on all counts, I think that was a ridiculous law, although I totally agree with everything Yaron says about. The, the the excesses of, of Islam and and uh, so I, I think it was a horrible law in in every way and and I totally totally disagreed with it and stated it publicly also although it wasn't super popular with my own party. <coughs> I'm not a rant expert, so it's perhaps a little bit simplistic, but would you say that she is in favor of or against democracy? And what is this pretty simple <laughs> argument uh, that she may put sure, forward? Sure, I would say it depends what you mean by democracy. So if you mean by democracy, majority rule. That is, that you get a vote on everything, and whatever the majority says, that's what goes. Then, yes, she's very much against democracy. She's anti-democracy. If you mean just the act of voting, right? We, we, we're going to have a president the way we select the president by voting. And that's all, but, but that the role of government is limited, right? The president can't do much. <laughs> then she would be, she's pro that act of voting, and then you could call that democracy. So Ayn Rand believed that most of what government today does, it doesn't have a moral right to do. And therefore, government should be constitutionally limited to doing one thing, which is what I think the founding fathers of America tried to do, and that is limit government to the protection of individual rights, which means protect you from force and fraud and invasion, and that's it. So a Randian government would have a police, a judiciary to arbitrate disputes between us, to prosecute criminals, and a military, and that's it, right? Nothing else. So you can use democracy to vote the legislature, which would meet very infrequently because there wouldn't be much to do, but they would have to define you, uh, you know, as property rights evolve, maybe the internet's evolving, they would have to come up with some definitions. But no redistribution of wealth, no regulation of business, no, no central bank, no economic policy. So you can't vote. So what she's against is the idea that this side of the room votes to take the money of the people in that side of the room. That's what she's, and that's what democracy is. Democracy is this side of the room voting to take the money of those, or 
voting to regulate them or voting to control them or voting to tell them what they can wear covered with their face or whatever. That is, democracy is where the majority gets to decide everything. That she rejects. Right? And, and what's interesting is the left gets this like on free speech or used to get it on free speech, right? Or, or on abortion, right? So they accept that the majority can never, ever vote to ban abortion. Right? So democracy doesn't apply to that. What Ayn Rand says, that's right. They shouldn't be able to ever ban abortion, but they shouldn't be able to take your money. They shouldn't be able to regulate you. They shouldn't be able to control you in any way. So the majority should have no power over the individual. The only job of government is to protect us. That's it. Don't we all uh, th agree that there's some kind of line there? Maybe you don't think it's where Ayn Rand sets it, but let's say, let's say that that you know there's probably more people uh, of one sex than the other in Denmark. Uh, probably a little more women than men, I would imagine, right? So if we now had a vote and and the vote was to take away the vote from men, and all of the women decided that they would vote in favor of that, would you think that was acceptable? Even worse, if they if they voted that uh, all men should be killed. Would you think that is acceptable because they had a majority? I mean, there, there's got to be, and I think when we talk about m democracy in modern sense, because we've forgotten what democracy's history is, hi democracy always rested on two things. It, it rested on the fact that every now and again we've got to make some big decisions, and what is a better way than to raise our hands and, and kind of agree on that because there's no other way really. But the other thing was that it rested on some negative rights, that there were certain things that you could not do, even if you had the, the majority, right? And that's where you, that's the camp where you find Ayn Rand, right? Uh, uh, and I think every one of us here, I mean, you could probably find a vast majority of people that were not uh, redheads, right? So if we s had a vote here and said, everybody redhead should get executed, we don't want redhead in society, or everybody with a certain religion, or everybody with a certain certain sexual orientation or everybody with any kind of characteristic. I don't think a single person in the room would think that democracy carried that far, right? Or uh, am I wrong? I mean, <laughs> uh, anybody? Uh, so that there is this balance when we really need to make a decision, like maybe select a leader, maybe deciding on, on a really major item in and out of the EU or something like that. Maybe that's a good thing to, uh, to ask around. But if, if, if there, there obviously it's got to be some limit to that that interpretation of democracy as well. I can't imagine anybody nearly that wouldn't agree with that, right? Thank you. You guys seem to know this character Ayn Rand fairly well. I would, I wonder, and perhaps you can answer that for me, what would she arrive at if she lived today? Considering that the is is now a little more complicated than it used to be because we have all these civilizations that are very rapidly overlapping and interacting with each other in ways that seem, to me at least, to be moving the world in a direction where we're constructing our reality a little more than we did in the last century where we sort of just tried to reduce what we could see into actionable scientific things. That's the question. What would she do today if she could to, m to manage all that? I mean, I, d I don't think there'd be much difference. I mean, obviously, the, the issues facing us today, I mean, she was very concerned about uh, communism uh, because that was the, that was the, the force, right, uh, the cultural force uh, during the 20th century that, that, that uh, and she, was she had intimate knowledge of communism because she grew up under communism. Uh, so today, communism is maybe not a not a force, although in universities it still might be. Uh, it, it's not a force. Maybe there are other forces, but but uh, I think fundamentally her positive philosophy would not have changed much. She would just have dealt with different issues in a terms of of uh, of critiquing. Uh, I think multiculturalism would be a big one. I mean, she talked about it somewhat when she wrote, but today it's much bigger. It's much more relevant because of this interlacing of civilizations or interlacing of cultures. Uh, the idea of multiculturalism, I think, is one she would be very offended by and, and argue against quite vehemently. Uh, she would be, I think, at the forefront of trying to defend what it is, what do we mean by Western civilization? What does that mean and, and how do we defend it properly? What is the proper defend of that, uh, of that civilization? Um, and I think she'd be worried about the nihilism and hedonism, maybe, that were mentioned earlier. Uh, so. 
uh, I, I think the challenges might be a little different, but <laughs> philosophically they're not that different. <laughs> and uh, I, I think her positive philosophy, I, I don't think that anything happened in the 30 years since she, she died, the 35 years since she died, that has changed the positive message that she had. I agree with uh, Yaron that she would uh, have a sort of no holds bars criticism of Islam that would be quite on the level with someone like uh, Christopher Hitchens or something, if not more, vitriolic than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would come from a place of genuine non-bigotry that allows one to speak freely because you analyze all ideas fairly. And of course, she would not find these ideas uh, commendable at all. Um, one thing where I think Ayn Rand might have changed her philosophy, if not the message, uh, then at least the, uh, let's say, the propositions contained therein is in the area of uh, evolution. Quite a lot have happened in evolutionary science uh, since the time of Ayn Rand. And also, uh, though she appeals to science a lot, she actually also says, I, I, I work out the concepts philosophically, I am not a scientist. Uh, and that's why also the teleological ethics that I went through, they're not really evolutionary in a way. They focus on man's power through his mind and through reason to better his condition. So she actually says very, very little about evolution in all of the work. And there has been significant findings such as the fact that we are quite possibly uh, not just conditioned through Christianity and so on, but also born with a sort of uh, altruistic instinct. And uh, we are not uh, blank slates as a an idea that uh, Rain took from Locke, which, which has uh, <coughs> been definitively refuted. So of course this happens to every philosopher. Uh, and I think maybe she would have changed her thinking on that point a bit. But the overall message, uh, the, the, the you can't exactly call it libertarian, but like free market, uh, individual liberty kind of political standpoint is uh, would have been the same. It's almost an arch type. I, I'll just say that I don't think, sh I don't think her, her, vision, her view of blank slate has been refuted. So, I mean, we, that's a whole discussion about what it means to say it was a blank slate. Uh, but certainly, I think, yes, uh, the, the science of evolution, I think, would have played a bigger role in uh, the way she explains her ethics, uh, given, given our, b our understanding of DNA today and our understanding of evolution at a much deeper level than I think it was understood 30, 50 years ago. I think you would have felt rather vindicated that, that uh, that, that, that actually she was right because I think a lot of the stuff that she predicts in that book uh, has come to, to, to a large extent uh, to, to manifest itself, you know, like the financial crisis where you had tons of acronyms of really weird organizations and pools of government money that's not going to fix the problem. This is like straight out of Atlas right? And, and, the, and the sales, obviously, of Atlas Roth and other books absolutely skyrocketed in the early parts of the financial crisis. So in a way... Other people recognized that that there was some something you could learn from her thinking there, and in general, I think she would be extraordinarily pleased that that uh, that she's still selling a lot of books, right? <laughs> which is very unusual for for a book that from 1957, in the case of Atlas Shrugged, and for a writer that died 36 years ago, is is very unusual to have the kind of sales that she has. So I'm sure she would have been quite excited that. Uh, that there's still a movement and, and it still inspires young people to uh, to get a different different view on, on, yeah. on life yeah. and ultimately she was anyway very very long term in in her expectations so she was kind of hoping correct me if i'm wrong that her ideas might have bigger impact 100 years 150 years 200 years down the line and so she was uh, seen from that point of view fairly patient and i think she would just feel rather vindicated that uh, she's not all wrong she has certainly not been proved wrong in the meantime. And, and I think she would have been inspired by the fact that the Berlin Wall came down. She fought all her life against communism. She won in that sense. I think, I think the fact that, you know, we can, we can debate the extent to which uh, China's capitalist, but it's the capitalist element within China <laughs> that have made China successful. That is, whatever it is, that they've, wherever they've adopted capitalism, wherever they, whatever regions or whatever industries have adopted these ideas, of free markets, that's where the success in China has been, not in the state-run industries. Um, that, I mean, I think that, that would have been exciting to her. That, you know, the fact is there are more people free today than ever in human history. There are more people living under some form of a free society or some form of capitalism in the world today than ever in human history. And, the, you know, in spite of the fact that we in the West seem to be kind of somewhat in decline or stagnating, the rest of the world isn't. I mean, Africa now is discovering property rights and the institutions of capitalism. Countries in Africa are booming, and 
uh, you know, Asia went through this phase. So there's, there's exciting things going on in the world that I think it would be fun to have her here to comment on them. Uh, when you read her nonfiction essays, not just Atlas Shrugged, but also nonfiction essays, the extent to which she was prophetic, not in the mystical sense, but in the sense of uh, understanding the trends, is astounding. I mean, she has an essay called Global Balkanization, where she talks about <coughs> balkanization in the 1960s. And she talks about all, e all the ethnic groups, each one wanting their own little country and their own little thing. And then you think about what happened in the Balkans when, 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 the, uh, you know, when Yugoslavia fell apart. And then you think about even today, everybody trying to establish their little domain, the tribalism that exists today. Uh, I, you know, she saw it coming. She saw the inevitable consequences of ideas back in the 50s and 60s, where they would lead down the road. Um, so, so I think a lot of the problems today you can find in her books. Uh, she's got a book on environmentalism. That in those days, it wasn't called environmentalism. It was called ecology, right? It wasn't called. <coughs> and, and a lot of the issues that we see today in terms of the con some of the, 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 the extreme nuttiness uh, you already see in a book she wrote in 1969 when this is just beginning, and she already predicted where it would go. So it's so really can fascinating. Can I ask you a question, yeah. uh, Your Honor? Yeah. Because this is a question I get asked uh, <laughs> relatively frequently because and I think I know what the answer is, but uh, in this country I'm pretty much nearly the only guy that has just a little kind word for Trump sometimes for his tax <laughs> cuts <laughs> and for his, for his uh, di diffusion of regulation yeah. and this and that. Uh, but I often get asked, uh, what would Ayn Rand have thought of Trump? Uh, and <laughs> I don't think she would have been, I don't think she would have been uh, very, very excited about him. But what's your view? Yeah, I mean, I, I've talked about this a lot. And, <laughs> and those of you who know me know, uh, again, I don't want to talk for Ayn Rand because who knows what Ayn, Ayn Rand was a, a genius and I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I, I think she would have despised him. I mean, so she wrote, she wrote in the early 1960s about John F. Kennedy that he was the first complete pragmatist, pragmatist in the negative sense, pragmatist, a short-term thinker, no principles, no ideas, uh, anti-ideology. She considered JFK this anti-ideological, complete pragmatist, the worst president ever, right? He, he was terrible. And when I think of JFK today versus Trump, <laughs> JFK seems like an angel. I mean, <laughs> um, he also cut taxes, by the way, uh, JFK did, but uh, because he was so, he had no principles, everything was what a work, and, and and JFK hid that. He always pretended to have principles. The thing about Trump is, and this is true, you know, all politicians lie all the time. The difference is that Trump relishes lying. He, he doesn't try to hide it. He doesn't pretend like he's not lying. It's like, it works, so I'm going to do it again. Like he was asked in this interview, do you think what you said was inappropriate? <coughs> he said it worked. <laughs> what, does it, what difference does it make, right? If it was inappropriate or not, moral or not, ethical or not. Truth or not, it works. That's pure pragmatism. Is he a happy man? Y uh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, look at him. You know, have you seen how his wife looks at him? <laughs> you can't be happy when your wife looks at you like that. Um, so I, I, I think she would have, in spite of here and there, a good thing that he's done. Certainly, cutting taxes is good, although raising spending, uh, uh, the U.S. is spending more now than than under Obama. Uh, and it's, it's growing dramatically, spending, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of cutting taxes. If you cut taxes and you don't limit spending economically, it just doesn't work. It works short term, but it doesn't work long term. He is cutting regulation. That's the one thing that, but, but again, he's doing it at the agency level, so it's not sustainable. It's not, it's not legislation that cuts <coughs> regulation. It's just the behavior. Um, but I think it's character. His character is so coarse and so vile. And and the the issue of honesty and rationality. You don't think Trump rationality. You don't think Trump thinking before he tweets. You think tweet. Uh, he's got one genius, and and you have to recognize that he knows what people want. He he is a marketing genius. He understands the American people, a certain segment of the American people, brilliantly, <coughs> and he and he feeds them exactly what they want. So, just as he used his genius in marketing to 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 be successful in real estate, um, I, I think he's using his his marketing genius to be successful in politics and so far you have to say he's been successful right I, I, and, and we'll, we'll see if he gets reelected but there's a good chance he, he will get reelected in spite of everything um, so yeah so okay go on this is too fabulous but okay. you have the opportunity to wrap you up you said you had a question no I have no questions all right. all right 
Well, I, I just want to thank everybody, and I want to do a few things. One is to encourage you all to read Ayn Rand. The best way to learn about her is firsthand, and, uh, and there's, there's a lot to read. And it's fun. I mean, I'm always jealous of people who haven't read Atlas Shrugged because you get to do it for the first time, or The Fountainhead, or We the Living, or Anthem, any of her books. They're, they're, just, they're just wonderful books to read beyond the life-changing ideas, or at least some of them for some of, they were for some of us life-changing. Um, I'd also like to let you know that there is a conference going to be held in Europe for the first time uh, by the Ayn Rand Institute uh, on Ayn Rand's ideas in February, uh, so February 15th to 17th in Prague. We're going to be holding a weekend conference uh, dedicated to Ayn Rand's ideas. For those of you who might be students in the audience, uh, there are scholarships available. So for you, it'll be basically free. We'll pay for your travel expenses and everything else. So, so uh, maybe even academics will uh, will, will pay expenses. Uh, uh, but uh, but I, you know, I encourage those of you who are interested in delving deeper and in, in meeting some of the people involved in it, in in the in the kind of Ayn Rand world, uh, to to come to Prague. Uh, Lars will be speaking there. I will be speaking there, and there'll be a, a number of very talented, I think, speakers. So it, it should be a fabulous event. And I'd like to thank our moderator, Christopher, and and CPOS for hosting this. So uh, so thank you. Thank you. 